Welcome to the Global News Podcast, your source for the latest and most comprehensive coverage of global events, breaking news, and in-depth analysis. We are here to guide you through the top stories from around the world. Whether it's politics, economics, culture, or science. Hello, this is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service, with reports and analysis from across the world. The latest news, seven days a week. BBC World Service podcasts are supported by advertising. The Global Story is your new daily deep dive into one big news story. And it's coming soon, Monday to Friday, from the BBC World Service. Search for The Global Story wherever you get your BBC podcasts to find out more. This is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Nick Miles, and in the early hours of Thursday, the 16th of November, these are our main stories. Israel releases a video of what it says are arms and ammunition found in Gaza's biggest hospital. The leaders of the two most powerful nations in the world meet in California. Verging on pure evil, says the UN, the war in Sudan is going from bad to worse. Also in this podcast, the secret of Taiwan's success in producing advanced computer chips. We recruit the best engineer and also operator that actually hands on in the factory are also very, very highly skilled. But is it under threat? And the two British actors whose love for one another over more than six decades has defied even dementia. But first, Israeli military forces are continuing their search of the Al-Shifa hospital complex, as we record this podcast, which Israel says Hamas has headquarters in tunnels beneath the hospital buildings. In the last few hours, the IDF has released a video on social media, which it says shows some of the materials recovered from a building in the Al-Shifa hospital compound. The BBC hasn't been able to verify the footage yet. The raid has drawn widespread condemnation, but Mark Regev, who's a senior advisor to the Israeli Prime Minister, told the BBC that Israel had no choice but to go into the hospital. We don't enter a hospital lightly. There has to be a serious reason for us to do so. But the fact that Hamas has used the hospital as a shield for its military machine, I don't think anyone serious doubts that today. Hamas has committed a war crime by turning the hospital into a war zone. Israel's actions are a response to that. Nick Beek is our correspondent in Jerusalem. So what exactly is Israel's military saying it's found inside the hospital? The IDF have posted some videos which they say was taken in the Al-Shifa complex as part of this military operation. And the videos show Israeli troops going through various wards. And at one point, one of the officers describes what he can see. And the camera points to some what look to be AK-47s, some some magazines, some bulletproof vests, something that the Israeli soldier says is a grab bag with different equipment that can be picked up and taken away. And And then they they also released a statement, the Israeli Defence Forces, saying that they discovered an operational command centre, weapons and technological assets. I think that probably means they're laptops because they're shown in the computer as well. So this is what the Israelis have shown on the video. But I think really worth stressing, the BBC isn't able to independently verify what we're seeing. Also worth stressing, Nick, that Israel has talked about this big underground command centre that Hamas has built, which Hamas had denied. There's no sign of that at the moment from the video the Israelis have put out. The United Nations humanitarian chief, Martin Griffiths, has once more appealed for an immediate ceasefire. Let's hear a bit about what he had to say. Silence the guns. Stop the fighting to allow the people to move safely. Do it for as long as possible. Allow them to move safely on their own, not hindered and not pushed. And silence those guns long enough to give the people of Gaza a breather from the terrible, terrible things that have been put on the, these last few weeks. Nick, we saw the first tanker of fuel to get into Gaza since this conflict started a month ago, come over from Egypt today. And Martin Griffiths has been talking more about plans to get humanitarian aid into Gaza, hasn't he? 
He has, yeah. He's talking about a 10-point plan, and one of the most important elements of this, he says, is to open one specific crossing, the Karem Shalom crossing, which was used to carry more than half, probably about 60% of all the trucks going into Gaza before the recent violence erupted. He says this is really important because the aid coming in through the Rafa crossing, which of course is in the south on the Egyptian border, that originally was designed for pedestrian crossings, not trucks. He says this will be really important. It will get more aid in. Another part of the plan is for lots of aid agencies to be able to bring in more people so that they can set up relief hubs so they can distribute aid to the people who need it. He also said there needed to be a lot more safe shelters for all the people that have been displaced, not just in schools, but in other public places. And he said this is what's needed to rein in the carnage and really give people a chance in Gaza, people who've suffered so much. That was Nick Beek in Jerusalem. Well, the UN Security Council has now passed a resolution calling for urgent and extended humanitarian pauses in the fighting in Gaza. It says that those pauses could last for days to allow the delivery of aid. As the war in Gaza rages on for the moment, it is thought that 239 Israelis and foreigners remain held captive by Hamas there. Many of their families are now marching from what's known as Hostages Square in Tel Aviv to the Prime Minister's office in Jerusalem. They want the government to do a deal now to bring home their loved ones. Our Middle East correspondent Yolande Nell reports from Tel Aviv. The enduring trauma of the 7th of October. More than 240 people were forced into Gaza at gunpoint from their homes, military bases and a large outdoor party. The fates of most are unknown. For their families, these are desperate times. She was taken by a motorcycle with two terrorists, one driving and one in front. Eyal Nouri's 72-year-old aunt, Adani Moshe, was snatched from her small community. When we meet in what's now known as Hostages Square in Tel Aviv, he says the Israeli government must do a prisoner swap to bring her back. They took them for a purpose. This purpose should be negotiated and give them whatever they want and release the hostages. And in past hostage ordeals, Israel has struck agreements, eventually. Back in 2006, a young soldier, Gilad Shalit, was captured by Hamas. It took five painful years to bring him home. He was exchanged for over a thousand Palestinian prisoners held in Israel in a huge victory for Hamas. But Gershon Baskin, a key negotiator from back then, doubts whether any major deal can now be done. What Hamas did, they crossed the line where it's inconceivable that they will continue to be in power in Gaza after this war is over. So there's some kind of built-in contradiction to trying to negotiate with the people that you intend on killing and making sure that they don't control the territory. Early on, Qatar did broker the release of an American-Israeli mother and daughter, and Egypt helped bring out two Israeli hostages. But no bigger deal has taken shape. With emotions running high, Israelis realise rescues are risky. Many back a prisoner exchange, but aren't ready to stop battling Hamas according to polls by Professor Tamar Herman of the Israel Democracy Institute. The public is not really totally with the families. Indeed, people are saying, bring them all back and we want them back. But when we asked, okay, what about the timing? Should we, for example, accept a deal which includes stopping the fighting, some kind of humanitarian ceasefire? The majority of the Israelis say no. In Tel Aviv, at the start of every Jewish Sabbath, relatives set a giant table with places set for all those missing. Malki Shemtov's son Omar is 21. He was last seen at the dance party near Gaza. And Malki follows every development in back-channel talks. It's better not to try to account on it or to have any opinion on it. And it is very difficult because for us, every small news... It's, it's a light. Increasingly frustrated, this week, Malki and others set off on a long march to the Prime Minister's office in Jerusalem. Fears are growing for the hostages. Hamas says some have been killed by Israeli airstrikes. Past experience taught Israelis that deals could be done. But now, the intensity of the war is bringing a new level of urgency. Yolanda Nell.
China and the United States have a very troubled relationship, from trade spats to disagreements over Taiwan. But that doesn't mean the leaders won't talk to each other. In fact, the US President Joe Biden and China's leader Xi Jinping were meeting in California on Wednesday. It was only the second time they've come face to face in their current roles. The meeting was taking place on the fringes of the Summit of Asia-Pacific Leaders in San Francisco. And President Biden underlined its importance. Mr. President, we know each other for a long time. We haven't always agreed, which was not a surprise to anyone. But our meetings have always been candid, straightforward, and useful. I value our conversation because I think it's paramount that you and I understand each other clearly, leader to leader, with no misconceptions or miscommunication. President Xi, for his part, called their relationship the most important bilateral one in the world. I asked our correspondent Gary O'Donoghue, who's at the summit, what Mr Biden said specifically about cooperation areas. The kinds of things where there is some kind of strategic coming together, if you like, are areas perhaps on climate change, on the green economy, where they see themselves as having some joint interests. And although the US and China see, you know, the conflicts in Ukraine and the Middle East as, you know, in very, very different ways, I think there is some sense among some American officials that, you know, China probably doesn't want a conflagration in the Middle East and it probably doesn't want the same in Ukraine. So there may be some things they can work on there together. But these two disagree on an awful lot of things, not least the status of Taiwan in the South China Sea and the East China Sea and where Americans have been coming into contact with Chinese naval and air forces and on issues of trade in particular. America has imposed significant tech embargoes on the transmission of sophisticated chip technology to China. There's a lot at stake now, isn't there, particularly with the security situation in the Middle East and also the ongoing crisis in Ukraine. I suppose America wants to secure some kind of coming together of minds over those issues. I think so. And I think that the the best they can hope for is perhaps for for China to encourage Iran in the Middle East uh, not to escalate the situation, its influence with groups like Hezbollah and the Houthis in in Yemen. That would be one aspect. But really, the the aims of this summit are pretty low. Americans talk a lot about stabilization, putting a floor under the relationship. They do want some things like re-establishing military to military communications, which have been severed for more than a year now. And the problem with that is that these two countries not talking means the risks of you know, accidents happening, stuff escalating, getting out of control is very high. So I think those will be considered as wins if they can do that, along with anything else they can come and talk about in in terms of artificial intelligence and on the question of the chemicals used in fentanyl production, which is an epidemic in the States. Gary O'Donoghue in San Francisco. So what about the response to this meeting from social media? I first found out about the official view from our Chinese media analyst, Kerry Allen. Whenever you see the US and Chinese leader come together in state media, there's always a very positive message. Although one thing I would say is that a word that has been emphasised this time around with Xi and Biden meeting has been stabilising ties. So there's been an acknowledgement that since the two leaders met in the last year, there has been a lot of friction between China and the US. And there is the hope that with them coming together to discuss a range of issues, that they'll be able to get that relationship back on track. That is the top line from Chinese state media. Clearly, it is not felt by everybody across that part of the world. What what unofficial uh, responses uh, have there been to, to this imminent meeting? Well, what I'm looking at in independent media, so media in Hong Kong and Taiwan, for example, there are people who have been protesting outside the hotel that Xi Jinping is staying at on issues like human rights. Um, I've seen in uh, in a Taiwanese news agency that uh, some Taiwanese reporters trying to film, they've said that they've been harassed. You would never get any of this messaging in state media in China. They, what people are seeing in China is a lot of Chinese people waving flags, very much wanting to welcome Xi Jinping. They're, they're not having the impression that actually there is criticism towards Xi and, uh, and that some people want to, with him being outside China, raise awareness that they don't feel very positively about him. Now, Carrie, it's a lot harder these days for that kind of dissenting voice to come out of Hong Kong. But is there anything coming up? Um, not on Chinese social media, because generally any images of protest 
against the Chinese presidency, the Chinese leadership is censored. But if Chinese people have access to a VPN, a piece of software that allows them to circumvent the Chinese firewall, they might see reports in, for example, the South China Morning Post newspaper, which shows that there have been people protesting in San Francisco against Xi Jinping, wanting to raise awareness about the Uyghur issue about about Taiwan. But China's internal message very much wants to emphasize that, that Xi Jinping is welcome everywhere around the world. But obviously, that is not the case, that there are criticisms from people within the US and also overseas Chinese towards the Chinese leader. Carrie Allen. Still to come on this podcast, it's not even yet summer in Brazil, but a heat wave already causes damage to the economy. Every weekday morning, wake up to one big story from the African continent. Where does Africa stand in this conflict? How is Africa responding to the refugee crisis? With me, Alan Kasuja, and Africa Daily. So what's it like living in an area where Boko Haram are active? One story from Africa for Africa. Our story. Africa Daily. That's Africa Daily from the BBC World Service. Find it wherever you get your BBC podcasts. Silicon chips are the lifeblood of the modern economy. They are in everything around us, and most of them are now made in one place, Taiwan. The island is claimed by China and following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. There's been a growing realisation that having so much of the world's chip production concentrated in one place may not be a great idea. But as our Asia correspondent Rupert Winfield Hayes has been finding out, moving chip production away from Taiwan is no simple fix. We invade to reshape the world. I'm inside an enormous aircraft hangar-sized exhibition centre on the outskirts of the Taiwanese capital, Taipei. And I'm surrounded by booths with names of companies that I've never heard of and I suspect most people have never heard of. This is where the semiconductor industry comes to show off its wares. The reason why this Semicon 2023 is here in Taiwan is because Taiwan absolutely dominates the making of the the semiconductors that go into everything around us. More than half of all the chips used worldwide are made here in Taiwan. The biggest manufacturer, Taiwan Semiconductor, or TSMC, is now the ninth most valuable company in the world. That makes this island strategically very important and its chip plants extremely vulnerable. In recent years, China's claims to Taiwan have become louder and more aggressive, and so pressure is building to move production elsewhere. But replicating what Taiwan has done will be much harder than building some new chip plants in Arizona and Dresden. This is the city of Xinjiang, about an hour south of Taipei, and today Xinjiang is a world centre of chip making. On either side of the road here are the huge chip fabrication plants of TSMC, each building the size of several football fields. The details of what goes on inside them is a closely guarded secret, but these plants are considered the most modern and efficient in the world. The story of how Taiwan got here begins 44 years ago with a group of young engineers and an experimental chip plant licensed from an American company called RCA. The demonstration plant that we built, I was the plant manager. One of those young engineers was Shi Qin Tai. It was a surprise to everyone, to us and also to the uh, US RCA people. Shi and his team proved that Taiwan could not only make semiconductors, but do so better than the big US and Japanese makers. So how did they do it? Well, it may be a mystery. <laughs> I think first is uh, it's a brand new facility. Secondly, we recruit the best engineer and also the operator that actually hands on in the factory are also very, very highly skilled. This young man worked at one of Taiwan's biggest electronics companies. He describes low pay, a strict hierarchy, and 12-hour days, six days a week. But unlike in the US and Europe, he says Taiwan's engineering graduates have few other choices. It's one of the few industries where you can make enough money to buy a car or get a mortgage, he says. So even if working conditions are bad, 
people will still suck it up. Other choice, so you just suck up and accept. The other key to success has been specialization. From the start, Shi Qintai says TSMC decided it would not design or market its own chips. So that's the basic idea: is that you do not compete with your partner. It was a service-oriented manufacturing. They do not have the product, which means they collaborate with many, many customer. This has allowed TSMC to grow very fast. Forging difference-making technologies that improve our environment. It is this ecosystem that's now under threat. A conflict over Taiwan would have devastating consequences, not just for the chip industry, but for the whole world economy. People here are understandably proud of what Taiwan has achieved. Now in his 70s, Xu Qintai says he feels extremely lucky to have played a small part. I hope the world appreciates how precious this industry is, he says, and they don't do anything to destroy it. Rupert Wingfield Hayes. The United Nations humanitarian coordinator to Sudan says the violence is verging on pure evil. The war between the Sudanese army and the rapid support forces began seven months ago, but there has been a surge in violence in recent days. The fighting was originally sparked by disagreements over a plan intended to lead to a transition to civilian rule. So, how has the war come to this point? Nuala McGovern has been speaking to our reporter Mohammed Hashim. When war broke out in Sudan in April this year, it was over political differences between,、uh, on the one hand, the Sudanese army headed by General Abdel Fattah Al Burhan, and on the other hand, the rapid support forces headed by General Mohammed Hamdan Dagalo, who is also known as Hameti, and it was over the provisions of. A framework agreement that was being designed and orchestrated by the EU, United Nations, and、uh, the political opposition grouping known as the Forces for Freedom and Change. And the thorny point then was the issue of merging the rapid support forces into the army. Seven, eight months on, the war is still ongoing in Khartoum between the army and the rapid support forces, and it's also taking place across the country in Darfur, in particular, where we've seen an uptick in the fighting over the past two weeks, with the RSF seizing Sudan's second largest city, Niala, and uh, then. Uh, Seizing the cities of Jinena and Zalinji. The problem is the fight in Darfur has an ethnic dimension, as we've seen in, in West Darfur, where the rapid support forces and Arab militias backing them have launched a campaign against Masalit ethnicity. Some 8,000 people there were killed, and more than half a million have fled from there to Chad. But there is also inter-ethnic fighting between the Arab. Ethnic groups that support the RSF, and we're hearing reports of a massacre that has happened south of Khartoum over the last couple of days in a town called Jabal Aulia. So the situation over the country is not good. There has been an uptick in the fighting in recent days. What do you know about the situation of people on the ground? The situation on the ground is terrible. The warring parties, the Sudanese army and the rapid support forces, have failed in securing humanitarian corridors. For now, most of the humanitarian community and the international staffers are struggling to come into the country because of access and、uh, visa issues. But on the ground,、uh, people are struggling with lack of food, lack of water. Lack of power. You have to keep in mind that at the moment Sudan has about seven million people internally displaced because of this war, and added to it, over the rainy season there have been the problems of the outbreaks of dengue fever and malaria, and millions of children are facing starvation and malnourishment. And is there any hope about negotiations to come to some sort of arrangement which would be peaceful? People have been watching the developments on the political side of things. There is the Jeddah Forum, where the two parties have been trying to speak since the start of the war. Nothing has really come out of it. The head of the Sudanese army, Abdel Fattah Al Burhan, was in Nairobi to try and have talks with President William Ruto to see if EGAD could fast track some sort of a mediation process. And the political opposition has been trying to somehow. Form some sort of a united civilian front. Efforts at that are failing. At the moment, it doesn't seem like there is an end in sight. 
Mohanad Hashim. The United Nations says 200,000 people have been displaced in northeastern Myanmar by fighting that began last month. There's also been an upsurge in fighting elsewhere in Myanmar. Our Asia-Pacific regional editor, Mickey Bristow, reports. Late last month, clashes broke out in northern Shan State between the army and a coalition of rebel groups. The UN says tens of thousands of people have been displaced, many of them moving towards the border with next-door China. Analysts said the army was facing its biggest military challenge since seizing power in a coup in 2021. Ethnic rebel groups have been battling the military for decades, but there's been an increase in fighting across Myanmar over recent months. An opposition government-in-waiting has also taken up arms. An unprecedented heatwave in Brazil is seeing temperatures continuing to reach over 40 degrees Celsius. Electricity consumption broke records earlier this week as people across the country turned on the air conditioning and the fans in a desperate attempt to stay cool. Katie Watson is our South America correspondent and Ed Butler asked her what kind of temperatures she was experiencing. Well, here in Sao Paulo, it reached 37.8 on Monday. In Rio over the weekend, 42.5 degrees Celsius. And in fact, that it felt like, because of the humidity, um, the temperature felt like 58.5. So certainly it's not an appealing prospect at the moment, leaving any air conditioned space. If you can, if you're lucky enough to have it, certainly people are, are trying to stay indoors. There are red alerts across the country. There are 15 states with red alert, including here in Sao Paulo. Paulo and the federal capital. And that basically means the temperatures may be five degrees above average for longer than five days and could pose a serious danger to health. Yeah, red alerts. How does that affect an economy like Brazil's? Presumably, all kinds of business is taking usually operates outside, right? How are people functioning? How are businesses functioning? Yeah, I mean, because of, I mean, you mentioned it there with energy consumption just breaking records. It means that there's been intermittent energy outages, certainly, you know, across the country. And that's, you know, increasingly problematic, given that people are desperate for air conditioning and may not even, you know, get access to that. Fridges, that sort of thing. I mean, there's been reports of some shortages in supermarkets. Every business here, you know, into the summer, or or rather it's a month before the beginning of summer. So that's probably quite important is it's only set to get hotter and so you know people just trying to keep themselves cool businesses trying to to function uh, normally everyone here is is suffering including transport of course there's been outages on transport today is a bank holiday so it's actually relatively calm relatively quiet on the streets but uh, the traffic yesterday was terrible people not being able to get to work not being able to move around the city and opting for road transport because some of the trains were down as well so it's difficult i mean certainly it's eased up because it's a holiday but you know heading back on thursday and the temperatures are set to continue for the next few days katie watson in sao paulo Now, they're two of the best-known names in British acting, and together, Prunella Scales and Timothy West have just celebrated 60 years of marriage. The couple first met in 1961, filming a BBC play, which they say was an absolute stinker. But one good thing to come out of it was their love story, which Timothy West has shared in a new book. He also writes about what life has been life since his wife Prunella was diagnosed with vascular dementia. Our entertainment correspondent, Colin Patterson, has been to meet them both. We used to keep talking to each other through letter writing. Theatre Royal Nottingham, October 1961. We didn't play on the Monday this week because in the afternoon the stage was needed for an ambitious cookery demonstration. You write us lovely letters, marvellous letters. Well, yes, we both loved writing to each other, sometimes Two or three times a day. Prunella Scales and Timothy West, sitting in the front room of their South London home, looking back over 60 years of marriage. Basil. <laughs> Her most famous role was as Sybil Faulty in Faulty Towers. A girl like this could possibly be interested in an ageing, brilliantine, stick insect like you. <laughs> Timothy West is regarded as one of the finest stage actors of his generation. I have full cause of weeping. But this heart shall break into a hundred thousand floors, or ere I'll weep. And together they had a recent unlikely hit with Channel 4's Great Canal Journeys. Cast off, please. Aye, aye, sir. But for the last 20 years, meaning for almost a third of their marriage, Prunella Scales has had vascular dementia. 
It was 2001 when her husband first spotted that something was not right. I came to see a play that Prue was doing. I went to see the first night and it was fine. It was much enjoyed by the audience. I went to see it again a, a bit later on and I thought Prue's a bit strange. She's not totally with it. I mean, it wouldn't have bothered any ordinary member of the audience. But I knew that she had just not quite been on top of it. It was more than a decade later that the diagnosis for dementia yes, came. Yes, it was. So yes, it? yes, it was. We went to see a, a specialist who just said, oh, I'm sorry, you know, this is just something that happens to you when you get older. It's not going to get any easier, but you can cope with it. Don't let it get you down. And somehow we, we, we have coped with it, and Prue doesn't really sort of think about it, do you? Well, my love? No, well, there you are. What don't, I don't think about it. What, what don't I think about? Dementia. Dementia. You're not bothered by it, are you? Well, I, I think elderly people get it anyway, don't they? Um, well, some do, yes. We manage. Timothy West decided that the year of their diamond wedding anniversary was the perfect time to write Prue and Me, a love story, which doesn't shy away from talking about dementia, but understandably mainly focuses on the fun. Have you read it at all? Yes, I wrote some of it. How do you feel your relationship has changed over the years? I don't think it's changed at all. No, do no, you? no. I've got to know him better and better and better.